almost three months ago, June 26, 2015, the United States Supreme Court issued a decision called Obergefell versus Hodges. And five of the nine justices on the United States Supreme Court changed the law that had existed for 6,000 years. And what they said is that it is now unconstitutional for a state to refuse to sanction and recognize marriage between people of the same gender. I read the entire opinion. I read all of the dissents. Four of the justices wrote dissenting opinions about how terrible this is for our country, about how terrible this is for our jurisprudence, for the rule of law. And some of them wrote dissents about the unintended consequences that this will have for religion, but also for the family. The majority opinion went into great detail about how the laws regarding marriage have changed over the years. And over the last couple of generations, the laws regarding divorce have changed significantly. You know, it wasn't that long ago before it was quite difficult to get a divorce. But it's not that way now. Now, if you go to a judge and say, I want a divorce, it takes some fees and it takes some attorney's fees, but basically you can get a divorce for no reason at all. No fault divorce, irreconcilable differences. These are recent things in the law. But we have some other recent things in our country. In 2012, which is the latest year I could find statistics, 36% of children 17 years of age and under are living in a home with no more than one of their parents, without at least one of their parents. More than one in three children in the United States are growing up at a home without at least one of their parents. This problem is much worse in the African American community. The number of children growing up in African American homes without one of their parents is over 50%. And there is a big question in our country as to why our jails are so racially disproportionate to our population. But a study of the statistics shows that if you made the rate of single parent households the same, our jail population would match exactly our regular population. The problem is not a racial problem. The problem is a fatherhood problem and a marriage problem and a single parent problem. 70% of juvenile delinquency, juvenile murder, dropout, and teenage pregnancy are by children from a single parent home. 70%. Some things have changed regarding marriage in our country. Some things have changed regarding divorce and regarding marriage. And I'm going to tell you something. The numbers are not a lot better in the church. The numbers are not a lot better in churches of Christ with the number of divorce, the number of single parent homes. And I know that some of you are divorced. I know that some of you are struggling to raise children without one of the other, the other parent there. And what I'm going to say tonight, I say with respect, and I say with sensitivity to your feelings, I am not trying to make you feel bad. I am not trying to make you feel ostracized because you have a place in God's kingdom and God loves you and God wants to save you and your children. But I'm going to tell you the truth about marriage. I'm going to tell you the truth about what the Bible says about marriage. Because the church of Christ should contain an overwhelming number of examples of healthy marriage. Our marriages in the Lord's church should be different than the marriages in the world. 
our marriages should be built on the Word of God and they should look different and they should feel different and they should bring different outcomes than what we're seeing in the world. But right now, to a great extent, they're not. So we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about seven different things that every marriage needs. I call them seven, seven secrets to bulletproof your marriage because they're not really secrets, but it seems like nobody knows them. And so that's why we call them secrets. People act like they never heard of them, so apparently they're secret. Well, we're going to bring them out of the closet tonight and look at them. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Some Pharisees come to Jesus, and once again they're trying to trick Him. They're trying to catch Him in something controversial, trying to get Him to say something that will turn the people against Him or that will give them some reason to criticize Him, to turn public opinion. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3, Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing Him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Guess what? This idea of how easy it should be to get a divorce is not new. It was going on in the first century. It was going on in very religious Israel in the first century. And they come and ask Jesus this very question. Verse 4, And he answered them and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they, know, they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They think they've got him. Verse 7, they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Read number nine again. Whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Brothers and sisters, it looks like we have forgotten the first rule of marriage. And the first rule of marriage is commitment. Every person in the world needs to understand that Jesus said you get one shot at marriage. At marriage, there are no do-overs. And every person needs to come into the marriage relationship with the attitude, this is the only opportunity I'm going to get to get married. And once I get married, I'm never going to leave this relationship except through death. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, if you divorce your spouse and you marry somebody else, it's a sin. And it's not just a sin to get remarried. It's a sin to have sexual relations with your new spouse forever. You're committing adultery against your first spouse. That's what He says. Matthew chapter 5, verse 32 he says it in a little bit different way. He says, Everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay? Look at what he's saying here. He's saying, If a man forces divorce on his wife, if a man divorces his wife and puts her out in the street, and the only way she can survive is to go and to marry another man. When she marries another man, she is committing adultery. The man who divorced her first is causing it, but she is committing adultery. The innocent wife who was thrown out in the street and the man who takes her in is committing adultery. You see here, Jesus creates a rule that makes marriage different than everything else in the world. There is no sin like this one. This one comes with a lifelong prohibition and no other sin does. He says, if you get divorced without adultery and remarry, it is adultery. 
And what that tells us, we get one chance. We get one chance. And we need to look at our marriage as this is forever. I went into a cell phone store a couple of years ago. A guy that I know have dealt with for several years, his mother-in-law and stepfather-in-law uh, came to our, attended our congregation for a while. His mother-in-law was never a member. And I went up to him and I was talking to him. said, hey, how you doing? He said, well, you know Becky and I split up. I said, what? Why? And he said, well, I came home one day and she said, I'm just not sure if I love you anymore. He said, well, you better figure it out or I'm leaving. He said, she didn't say anything, so I left. And now they're divorced. A few months ago, I was at a funeral for that family. And there was Becky with her new 13-year-old daughter. She's married somebody else. But that marriage is adultery. That's what Jesus said. Marriage is forever. And you have to commit to your spouse forever. This is it. And without that, it crumbles. If they think that there's a way out, if you think this isn't forever, your marriage starts out on the wrong foundation and shaky footing. Number two, open and honest communication. Marriage needs open and honest communication. You see what Jesus did in Matthew 19. He quotes Genesis chapter 2. He says, have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Go back with me to the book of Genesis chapter 2. This is a beautiful passage. God has introduced Adam to every creature. Every animal has been brought to Adam. Adam has named them all. And Adam now knows for certain he's all alone. There's nothing else in creation who is like Adam that's similar to he is that looks like he looks and moves like he moves and communicates like he communicates. He is alone. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. Let us make a helper suitable for him. Now God makes Adam fall into a deep sleep. He takes a rib from Adam's side and he fashions Eve. I can't help it, but I enjoy imagining what Eve must have looked like. Because everything that God made was good, and Adam would have been perfect, and Eve would have been perfect. She would have been the perfect representation of feminine beauty, the way God crafted it, as though with his own hands. And he brings her to Adam. He brings her to the man. Look at verse 23. When Adam looks at Eve, the man said, he's breathless. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Adam says, this is like me. She matches me. She, she fits me. And then God says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Brothers and sisters, people in the church are struggling with the idea of becoming one. The idea of becoming one is two people, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually, in what they want, in what they feel, in what they like, in what they dislike. People becoming the same. People getting together and matching up and melding their lives together completely. You know what that means? That means you've got to share. That means you've got to share. If you're going to become one with your spouse, your spouse has got to know who you are. Your spouse has got to know what you've been and what you've become, 
where you've been and what you've done and what you want to do and where you're going. You've got to share it all. There should be nothing in your life that's off limits to your spouse. Nothing in your truck, nothing in your wallet, nothing in your checkbook, nothing in your cell phone, nothing in your computer, nothing in your desk, nothing in your friendships, nothing in your life should be withheld from your spouse. Nothing. And that means when you bring home that bag and you tell your child, now don't tell daddy how much we spent on this. You're saying, you know what? We're going to be two on this. I'm not going to be one with him on this. Or when you tell your child, now don't tell mama we went down there. You're saying, we're going to be two on this. I'm going to reject that little instruction about being one this time. And you're turning your back on the will of God. Recently, I've been counseling a lady. She was married for 20 years. Grew up in Chattanooga, moved to Nashville. And she and her husband were having trouble. She knew things weren't right. He would almost never talk to her. Almost never say anything to her. Wouldn't answer questions. Kept his computer locked up. And one day she starts having heart problems and she says, I need to go to the hospital. And he doesn't want to take her. And he's putting it off. And he's saying, he's saying, well, maybe you'll be all right. Why don't you just rest? And she's like, I feel like I'm having a heart attack. I need to go to the hospital. And he waited over an hour before he agreed to take her. And it became clear to her that he didn't really care if she lived or died. She moved out, came home, moved in with her parents. They're in their 70s or 80s. Several people have tried to counsel with her. Several of our elders have tried to counsel with her. I've tried to counsel with her. It became clear that she didn't know her husband at all. She doesn't know why he won't talk to her. She doesn't know why he won't share with her. But every time you start to ask her questions... She acts like she knows it all. She acts like it's obvious and clear that it's all his fault. But she doesn't even know because she doesn't know him. And I suspect she didn't even know that she wasn't trying to get to know him. Open and honest communication requires that it be okay to share yourself. That it be okay how you feel and what you think. And that the other person is not going to tear you down or to criticize you for what you say what you feel what you think you have to have the space and the safety to become one by letting yourself be known and shared number three romance go with me to first corinthians chapter seven you know jesus quotes genesis 2 matthew 19 and genesis 2 says the two shall become one flesh that means emotionally and spiritually, but it also means physically. The two becoming one flesh has a very specific reference to the marriage bed and to the sexual relations between a husband and a wife. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, Paul says, But because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. We're going to keep reading, but let's stop and look at that. Paul says one of the main reasons of marriage is because of immoralities. Why should each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband? Because of immoralities. Let's be clear. Paul is saying to satisfy your natural sexual urge and to keep you from committing sexual immorality, get married. And that comes back to the bigger principle that sexual conduct outside of marriage is a sin. Marriage is the place that God created for satisfying the sexual urge. And satisfying it outside of marriage is a sin. It's immorality. It's sexual immorality. 
verse 4. No, verse 3. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I talked to an elder a couple of years ago, and he talked to me about a situation that occurred in his congregation. He says a lady contacted him, a young mother in the congregation contacted him and said, I need you to talk to my husband. My husband is developing a close relationship with a woman at his work. And she says, I don't think it has gone too far yet, but he's talking to her all the time. He eats lunch with her every day. She's texting him on his phone. And I've talked to him. My parents have talked to him. And nothing seems to work. So the elders call the, the man in. And they talk to him. And the man said, yeah, I, I do have a really close friendship with a woman at work. It has not been physical. But I'll tell you something else. After we had our third child, my wife said she doesn't have any use for sex anymore. She doesn't need it. She's got three kids. She's past, she doesn't, it's, it's a part of her past, not part of her future. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5 says, Stop depriving one another. That's pretty clear. It's a commandment from Scripture. And that woman is violating that commandment. She is violating her duties as a wife. And I can tell you generally that the general rules here don't apply universally. There are significant numbers of exceptions to the general rules, but the way men and women look at this issue is very different. The way women tend to look at it generally with big exceptions women look at it as I need commitment I need to know that you care about me and that you're concerned about me and then I feel comfortable enough to engage in this part of our relationship men's desire is much more urgent it's much more physical and less emotional it tends to be more powerful than the woman's especially when they're younger and that may change as they get older but the two frustrate each other if the man's need is not met he's far less likely to show the care and the concern and the love and the commitment that makes the woman open to fulfilling the need and if the woman is not getting the care and the concern and the commitment that she needs she's much less likely and so it becomes a vicious cycle both of you ought to break it. But if one of you doesn't break it, it'll ruin your marriage. It will ruin your relationship. I had a close friend, committed Christian, a man that, that I love to this day, was arrested in a prostitution sting on Craigslist. His wife divorced him took their daughter, shame on him, shame on the church. His entire congregation was mortified. But I knew because of our relationship and the things that we shared that she refused to meet his need over a long period of time. Does that give him an excuse to commit adultery? Absolutely not. Does it explain why he probably did? Absolutely, yes. Does it excuse him going to a prostitute? Absolutely not. Does it explain probably why he did? Absolutely, yes. Did he violate his marriage commitment? Did he violate his oath before God? Absolutely, yes. Did she violate the word of God? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. This type of frustration can ruin a marriage. Number four, encouragement. Go with me to the book of Ephesians. 
I want to look, Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to look at part of Ephesians chapter 5 in a couple of the other points, but I want to back up and look at some general things. One of the, one of the issues that comes up sometimes is people treat their family members worse than they treat their church members or their co-workers. I know that sometimes I can be more patient, more forgiving, more open to people at church than I am to people that I live with in my house. Before we look at Ephesians 4, I want to tell you 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11 says, Encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Now that applies to all of us. It applies to how we treat Christians. But wouldn't that also apply to how we treat our spouses? Encourage one another and build up one another. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor along with, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And you back up to verse 25, it says, Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. We talked about open and honest communication and telling the truth about what you feel, telling the truth about what you think. And ladies, I'm going to be honest with you. I think you're stronger than apparently some men think you are. And I want you to know, my wife did not kill me for telling her age Sunday. My wife is not a fragile egg. She doesn't break open at every little thing that she might not like. I once told her that I didn't like her hairstyle. That's true. I waited over a year to tell her. But sometimes we act like men can't be honest about what they really think. And what I thought for over a year is why are you fixing your hair the way everybody else likes it instead of the way I like it? And I literally thought that for over a year. And I was treating her like she wasn't strong enough, like she didn't have the psychological ability to deal with it. But you need to be honest but you need to be honest carefully. You need to be honest encouragingly. You need to be honest lovingly. And that's what the end of chapter 4 is is about. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. We need to have the attitude with our spouses. I don't expect you to get everything exactly right. I don't expect you to reach a much higher standard than I ever reach myself. But sometimes we do that. Sometimes we expect our wives to know our tools as well as we do, or we expect our husbands to know the grocery stores as well as we do. And it's unreasonable. Something that we don't hold ourselves to. We need to have an attitude of kindness. Verse 29, no unwholesome word. Only a word as is good for edification. I told my wife the truth about what I was feeling because she needed to know. She needs to know who I am. She needs to know how I think. She needs to know how I feel because if she doesn't, she can't adjust to me. But if I say it in a way that demeans her, if I say in a way that tries to tear her down, tries to make her feel like she's less than I am, well, then she just gets mad. Just like I would get mad. Just like you would get mad. And then you have things like verse 30. Bitterness and wrath and clamor. We don't want that in our marriage. We want speaking the truth, but in a way that edifies. In a way that encourages. A lot of women think, my husband won't ever talk to me. He won't ever 
tell me about his day. He won't ever tell me what's going on. But have you ever said, when your husband said, man, you won't believe what happened to me today. And you say, well, I'll bet it wasn't as bad as what happened here. And what are you really saying? I don't care what happened to you today. What happened to you today is not as important as what happened to me today. That's not encouraging. That's not edifying. And so what does he do? He goes in, he turns on the TV. He says, fine, well, you don't want to talk, we won't talk. It only has to happen a few times, and then pretty soon it's been two years since you talked. And now you've got this habit where you don't know how to talk. And it's completely different than it was when you were dating over just the little things that create the space. Number five, time. This is an interesting one. I noticed when I was in your library the other day that you have a book in there that my mother-in-law gave us when we got married called His Needs, Her Needs by Willard Harley. Michelle and I have read that book more than once. It's been very helpful. We've read his other book called uh, Love Busters, which if you're, if you're fighting a lot, if you're having trouble being kind and loving to each other, if the feelings of love are not nearly what you know they ought to be, it's a really good book. It was for us. But Willard Harley says that couples need to spend 15 hours a week together in meaningful interaction. 15 hours a week. We've counted it up. It's hard to do. It's extremely, and we seldom get there. Go with me to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to look at one verse in Deuteronomy. This is the law of God. This is like Exodus and Leviticus. Those books all give different parts of the law of God. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 gives a law for soldiers, but it's a very interesting little rule. Just one little, one little rule for new wives. It says, When a man takes a new wife, he shall not go out with the army, nor be charged with any duty. He shall be free at home one year, and shall give happiness to his wife whom he has taken. We, uh, our youth minister at Mountain Creek got married a year and a half ago, a little less than a year and a half ago. And he married a, a wonderful young woman, grew up in the church, and she has been a real blessing to him and a real blessing to our youth group, a blessing to our children, a blessing to our entire congregation. But she moved from Knoxville to Chattanooga. She didn't know anybody hardly in Chattanooga except her husband. She started a brand new job. She just graduated college, finished her student teaching, moved to Chattanooga, got married, and she felt alone. She felt like she didn't know anybody and nobody knew her. She felt like everybody knew her husband and everybody loved her husband and everybody was interested in her husband and nobody cared a thing about her. It wasn't true. We tried to give her attention, but that's how she felt. I'm guessing that many of you can remember the tears of the first year of your marriage. I'm guessing that many of you know other people who really struggled that first year of marriage. Deuteronomy 24 says the man needs to be at home with his wife, especially during the first year. But the principle is even bigger than that. The principle, it is, the principle is for the two to become one they have to spend time together. And if you've got little kids, man, it's hard. It's hard. You've got school, and you've got piano, and you've got softball, and you've got football, and baseball, and soccer. You've got mama's thing over here, and church's thing over there. You get to bed at 10.30 at night. You get up at 5.30 in the morning, and it never stops. How am I going to spend 15 hours with my wife? Hire a babysitter. Find somebody to watch your children and spend time, just the two of you, together. To be one, you have to know each other, and to know each other, you have to spend time together. You don't have to spend money together. You have to spend time together. 
number 6. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is about Christ and the church and he draws us an analogy between marriage, the relationship of husband and wife and the relationship between Jesus and his church and he teaches us some very important things about marriage in the context of Jesus and the church. One of those things is in verse 25 which is sacrifice. Husbands Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, this does not come with an exception. This does not come with a list of requirements that justify your love. Okay? This does not say, love your wife when she gets the laundry done and gets the kids taken care of and gets supper cooked. It does not say that. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What that means is, Husbands, love your wives in a way that gives yourself up for her. Sacrifice. Now we're going to look at leadership in the home Number seven, but leadership in the home is servant leadership. It's sacrificial leadership. I have some very dear family members, blood relatives of mine, who were married for over 30 years. They're still married, and they recently moved back in together. And I praise God for that. That is the answer to prayer. But several months ago, his wife moved out because he took the leadership of the home, but he didn't take it sacrificially. He took it for what was good for him. He took it for what made him happy, what fit his schedule, what made his life better, and not what made life better for his wife, not what made, better, what made life better for his family. He did not give himself up for his wife. And she got to where she couldn't take it. But look at verse 22. Number 7. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Ladies, this is the opposite of what the world teaches. This is controversial. This is considered chauvinistic and pig-headed. But this is Bible. This is what God said. God said, Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. You may not like hearing it. I talked to a young woman recently who grew up in the church who said she never heard it. She never heard that she was supposed to subject herself to her husband. She thought, she thought you don't bow down to any man. And that's what our culture teaches. Apparently that's what some of our brethren are teaching. But what the Bible teaches is the husband is the head of the wife. Now the husband is supposed to be a sacrificial leader. The husband is supposed to be leading in a way that gives himself up for his wife and for his family. But verse 22 and 23 don't come with an exception either. They don't come with an exception for the husband who's not sacrificing himself, for the husband who's putting himself first. Wives, be subject to your husbands. It may sound painful, but I want you to know that servant leadership Godly leadership is better for the follower than for the leader. And when it works the way God intends it to work, when it's followed the way God wrote it to be followed, it brings happiness. It's one of those things that is counterintuitive to us. It seems like it doesn't make sense, but it brings us something better than we would have ever asked for on our own. And that's a mate. 
That's a partner in life that shares everything you have and everything you are and helps you go where you need to be. Now, subjection doesn't mean that a woman is not supposed to have wisdom. It doesn't mean that she doesn't have a voice. It doesn't mean that she doesn't share what she thinks and share what she thinks ought to be done with the husband. But it means she respects his place. She respects what God has chosen for him and assists him and encourages him in leading the way God wants to go. But even when he leads in a way that she thinks is not where God wants to go, she's in subjection. That doesn't mean she sins. That doesn't mean she follows him into sin or immorality. But it means she stays in subjection to her husband. And in so doing, she teaches her husband a valuable lesson about faith in God and trusting his word. Which, when the seed is planted, it won't return empty. I hope you'll remember these very simple ideas that every, every marriage needs. Marriage needs commitment. Marriage needs communication. Marriage needs romance. Marriage needs time. Marriage needs encouragement. Marriage needs sacrificial leadership. And marriage needs subjection. With these things, a lot of problems will go away. A lot of hurt feelings will be healed. And a lot of happiness will be brought into your life. I really appreciate your attention tonight. I appreciate your attention all week. But I want you to know that I would be happy to stay here all night if I can help you get closer to God. If you are outside of Christ, if you are away from Christ, God has blessed you with a wonderful opportunity to have your sins taken away. God's Word sometimes seems like it asks for a lot of changes, seems like it may ask for difficult decisions from you, but those decisions are always in your best interests. Those sacrifices are always to your benefit, and the blessings you receive in return are far greater than anything you give up. If you've been holding back, if you've been thinking about answering the invitation, do it tonight. If you're away from Christ, coming to Christ for the first time is very plain and simple in the New Testament. It begins with hearing the Word of God and faith in what you hear. Believing that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. It continues with confession. Standing up and with your mouth saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And repentance. Turning away from your selfishness and surrendering your life to your Creator and your Savior. It culminates in baptism, being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, united with Christ in the likeness of His death, washing away your sins. If you need to come to Christ for the first time, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.